This is episode number seven of the Expert Table Tennis Podcast. My name is Ben Larkham and on today's show I'm joined by Lloyd Gregory who is a full-time table tennis coach based in Cardiff and he has just set up a table tennis coaching website with Daniel Ives from episode five and six and it's a website that's actually aimed specifically at coaches, helping coaches improve their table tennis coaching which is something that, as far as I'm aware, isn't really available on the internet at the moment. There's lots of websites aimed at players, but none aimed at coaches. So I'm going to be talking to Lloyd about that. If you're a coach, this is going to be a particularly good episode for you. If you're a player, there's still going to be loads of useful stuff in here. We're talking about things about strategies for making practice more effective, which is really relevant if you're a player and you kind of take control of your own sessions. We're comparing group coaching to one-to-one training, which is better, what kind of practice you should be doing. So whether you're a coach or a player, I'm sure you're going to enjoy this episode. Let's get straight into it with Lloyd Gregory. So I'm joined today on the podcast by full-time table tennis coach Lloyd Gregory, who has just started up uh, a table tennis coaching website with Dan Ives from the last episode called I Coach Table Tennis. So Lloyd, welcome to the show. Hi Ben, right. Great to have you on. I think the first question that I wanted to ask you, because I know a lot of people will know Dan from Table Tennis Daily, and they might have seen you on the forum as well, but kind of how did you get started in table tennis and what's your kind of your history in the sport? Um, well, I was a player for a long time, um, started when I was quite young, before 10 years old. I grew up, I went to college, went to Bristol Academy of Sport. And I was there for about four years and that's where I started doing a bit of coaching as well at the same time as playing. And uh, from there, I went on to university to do um, a coaching degree and then following my degree, I did um, a master's degree in performance coaching and um, moved over to Wales permanently and um, there's a club down here, Cardiff City Table Tennis Club, and I managed to secure a full-time position here, and that's now my full-time job. Okay, so you you transitioned from playing to coaching at quite a young age, is that right? Um, yes, yeah, so probably probably around 17, 18. I you know first started taking some coaching sessions, you know, earning a bit of extra money whilst I was a sure. student and. Um, yeah, it was really enjoyable. And that was when you were at the Bristol Table Tennis Academy. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, I occasionally did some did some stuff in some schools around the Bristol local area, and um, we had you know some some of the school kids come to the college as well on a Wednesday evening for like um kind of like a development session. I used to help run that, so that's where I started. One thing I actually wanted to to point out because I, I love stats and rankings and all that kind of thing so yeah. before before you jumped on I was going through old ranking lists yeah um I don't know if you know this but in 2009 you were ranked 316 in the men um I didn't that, that was in July okay uh, 2009 right yeah 2009 July you were 316 yeah 12 months later you were 81 really that's a big jump <laughs> <laughs> that's a big jump isn't it yeah I wanted to ask what happened in that season, 2009 to 2010. You went from 316th to 80, 81. Well, that was that was um, what year was that then? I think that would have been. Well, I was in your first year senior. First year senior, yeah. So, um, yeah. Well, I I think I just started the second course I took here at Bristol Academy then, so I probably had a bit more a uh, bit more free time on my hands <laughs> to train. Okay. Yeah, and I was probably entering a lot of tournaments as well at that point, probably going out every weekend to different Grand Prix and British League and all that. I think, sure. actually, that was probably my first year in British League as well. Okay, so it's first year kind of playing against a high-level opponent, getting the chances to, to get points off of them. Um, yeah, and I, like you said as well, I wasn't, um, I'd just come out of junior, so I wasn't spending any time playing junior tournaments. So. Yeah, so you could concentrate completely on the seniors. Yeah, stuff. yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> sure. Okay, so but that that gives people a, a rough idea of of where you got to as a player. You were kind of well inside the top hundred in in England. Um, yeah. Well, I <laughs> like to think I was comfortable there a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> and then it it kind of looks like after that you were you were then transitioning into full time coaching. And I think you've kind of have you stopped playing now. Uh, not completely, no. I still compete in um, the British League 
you know, the closer Grand Prix to me, like Cardiff and Bristol. But um, yeah, pretty much. The focus is on the coaching. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's all coaching, playing second fiddle now. And then you've you've started this website. Is it iCoachTableTennis.com? That's it. iCoachTableTennis.com. Yeah. That's the URL. And kind of what was the what was the logic behind that? The reasoning to start it up? Uh, well, there's um at university you kind of learn a lot about kind of the coaching science and the theory about it. And I just kind of noticed that you know when I went on you know the UKCC courses there wasn't a lot of similarities to what I was learning <laughs> on you know, the UKCC side and the university side. And I just want to kind of join them together so that coaches can have a bit of theory to supplement their practice. So it's, it's just kind of like, um, you know, informal learning for coaches, I suppose. Okay. What UKCC kind of qualification have you got? I'm on a level two. Well, I finished my level two. Yeah, I'd be looking for a level three soon, but there's none, none around. <laughs> Okay, so you got you've done done your level one and your level two. Yeah, and then because I think I found a similar thing. I studied coaching and sports science at university. Yeah, and then you know you, you had so much stuff from there, and then I went on the level two course afterwards. Yeah, and it did feel a bit like it was kind of living in the past, just kind of, or it, it was either going over very basic table tennis stuff, or like barely scratching the surface of the kind of coaching and sports science side of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I felt the same. Yeah. So what kind of topics are you are you sharing on the on the website at the moment? Well, it's quite varied at the moment. Um so much to go over, but um yeah, we've done a little bit on motivation. Um me and Dan have been doing stuff on motor learning as well, a bit on feedback and how you can get the most from your feedback and um the differences between learning and um the performance that you can see. Yeah, that was something that, that I was reading uh, a few weeks ago that I was really interested in was you were talking about how in practice, do we want players to be doing really well and kind of keeping the ball on really long rallies in the drills? Or do we want to be testing them with something more difficult where maybe it looks like they're messing up a lot in practice? Yeah, I think that was one of the early articles on iCoach. What's the, what's the science behind that? Um, well... The learning side of things, you can't really measure it. So, like, as coaches, I think sometimes I've been guilty of this, kind of looking at a player who's, you know, performing really well, they're doing really well on a task you've set them, and then just assuming that they're learning it because they, you know, they do it, but they'll come back next time and, they'll, and they won't be able to do it again and they'll have to build up again and again and again until that performance comes out. But if yep. they were really learning it, the first time then uh you know when they come back the next time they wouldn't have to start all over again they'd start from a higher level of performance because they've already learnt it so um yeah learning can be sectioned off into two different parts it's you know retention and then transferring so um if you're retaining the performance that means you've learnt it and if you can transfer it into different situations, that means you've learnt it. So um, if you're performing well one week in training and then the next week you come back and you can't do it again up to that standard, then you haven't learned what you set out to learn. I think this is this is quite a common play, uh, a common problem for, for players and for coaches. So I guess it, if you're the kind of player that you feel like you have a training session maybe twice a week you do really well in training, you feel like you've started to learn a new technique or, or a new element of the game. And then you come back next week and you've kind of forgot forgotten it again. Yeah. This is kind of where this really comes in, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. I think it all comes down to the type of practice. Really. I think that quite common is to practice something, you know, very repetitively, just one skill at a time. It's like, um, say you were working on a forehand open up. You'd say short backspin serve, dig long to the middle, and spin up from the middle, and then you know that's you're working on that one skill instead of as opposed to you know lots of different skills. And if you if you add the different skills in that you might have in a match, then you know it's going to be more match realistic, and you're more likely to retain the um you know what you've learned. Sure. 
it, it does seem, you know, from my experience of table tennis, that the majority of coaches, the majority of clubs are doing those kind of repetitive drills where you're just doing the same thing over and over. And that's, that's especially got that kind of Chinese heritage to it, doesn't it? Where you're just doing the same shot over and over and over. And the, and the belief is that if you get enough quantity, eventually you'll just become awesome at it. Yeah, well, I think, you know, there's, there's has to be some truth to that working. Otherwise, you know, how would it become, you know, practice in the first place? But um, I think there's more effective ways of going going about the practice. So I think if, if you did do that one skill over and over and over again, you'd obviously get very good at it. But would you be able to transfer it into a different situation? And are you retaining it enough that you don't have to go over and over and over again? Mm. Yeah. So what what kind of practice drills are you creating to try and overcome this? I think I think it's important to have everything in context. So um if you're working on a forehand open up like the example we've given then you need to put it in with the serve and you need to put it in with a variety of receives so it it's not just going to be that one that one receive it could be maybe the long to the middle and, you know, maybe short to the forehand or something, just to put that bit of, um, you know, doubt in their minds because they're going to have that in a game. And then I think that's important to be there when you're practicing as well. So, um, you know, at that point, you're working on two different skills. So it's been a bit more random, a bit more variable. Yeah. So when I'm designing a session or something, I'm, I'm always thinking, can I make it more like a match? than just you know multiple to the middle one one shot and are are the players enjoying this kind of thing uh well it depends it depends how you're kind of framing the exercise really if you're making it more like a match obviously it's a bit you it's easier to make a bit more competitive so you you can just play you know a bit top table short to the forehand receive have to go short to the forehand or long to the middle and then you know what kids don't like top table (laughs) And, yeah. um, you know, but if it's one skill over and over again, then, you know, they might get a bit demotivated because it's boring. OK, so you're finding that these kind of drills that are a bit more challenging, a bit more variable are actually going down better. Yeah, because it's not such, um, you know, it's not so boring to do over and over again. It's find a bit like um, a bit like serve practice. I've been thinking about serve practice a lot recently. And it's, you know, the best thing to do really is to stand there with a box of balls and practice your serve over and over again but how can you make that a bit more a bit more interesting like can you know do you do one short serve and then one long serve fast out wide do you try and give yourself points do you try you know do you put someone on the other end to receive the serves and then if they do a good receive they can get a point if you do a good serve you can get a point that sort of thing okay yeah because I know with the service practice, yeah. like we tried to get Sam doing 15 minutes of service a day for the expert in a year thing. Yeah. Uh, he just found that so boring and also so frustrating because yeah. he wasn't that good at his serves. So then when you're actually missing serves, like it can send you insane. I mean, eventually he just kind of gave up largely on doing service practice on his own just because he got fed up of it. No, definitely. I, I can uh, I can agree with that. As, as a player, I hated doing service practice because, I, yeah, I was doing the same thing. I just didn't want to stand there and just miss a load of serves. Um, you know, if you make it a bit more competitive, if you put that other player on the end, on the other end of the table to receive your serve, it's immediately more like a match and you can see where you're going with it. Yeah, so maybe we should be doing less just kind of, here's a bucket of 100 balls, do 100 reverse serves until you can get it right. Yeah, yeah, that sounds incredibly boring to me. <laughs> <laughs> But then you hear that kind of like in China, like when I was in Denmark this year, we're talking to Li Yang, who's now like the German technical coach. Yeah. And he's kind of saying that even from the age of five or six, they they'd just do like an hour of service practice a day over there just on their own. Yeah. You know, like I said before, I think there has to be some some sort of, you know, truth to that sort of practice. It, you know, it must work eventually. But, you know, in, in the Chinese culture, they probably, you know, a bit more disciplined than us over here and, you know, have a bit more time to practice that sort of thing. I think in the UK, you have to make the most of the time you've got with the kids. And if you're not making it fun, then it's not worth it. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Another blog post that I saw that you'd written recently yeah. was um, kind of comparing group training to to one on one training and coaching. Oh yeah, yeah. So, kind of, what was that about? What What was the point you were making there? Uh, well, I think the article was a bit one sided towards group training, but um, that's not really what I was trying to get. I was thinking a lot of players and also parents and maybe even coaches think that one-to-one training is the best thing for the player but I think you know there's a lot of benefits you get in group training that you don't see in a in one-to-ones like um you know the working together teamwork the um you know there's less reliance on the coach in a group session um because of you know you have less time with the coach but then you know that stops that stops, you know, constant feedback, and um, you know they have to think of think of improving their performance on their own most of the time, which is good for them. Um, yeah. You know, I think in my experience, it's easier to create a competitive atmosphere in a group session, which is more match specific as well. You need that pressure, that um, that competition to be trained. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean. We've written about this a little bit in our Expert in a Year book, kind of how before we started, definitely in my mind, I was thinking, well, if Sam can get one-to-one coaching every day, then he's going to, you know, that's going to be so much more valuable than just kind of like the standard group training that most people get, that he's going to improve massively faster. Yeah. But we, you know, after after a kind of like six months where he hadn't had much group stuff and it, it mainly just had the one-to-one, it really dawned on us that, you know, while one-to-one coaching is great, there are so many things that you get in group training that he was just completely missing out on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think I think you're hitting the nail on the head there. <laughs> and I think what you said about parents is that it's easy, particularly for kind of middle-class parents that are used to hiring tutors and, and music teachers and things like that to kind of see it as one-to-one coaching is, is kind of the best kind of coaching and group coaching is what you do if you can't afford one-to-one coaching. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good way to look at it. I think that's the view that a lot of parents have in the UK. But I think that's very misguided. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think I think so. That's why the um, that's why I wrote the article. Really, I think obviously there is a lot of benefits to one-to-one training, and particularly with beginners, because you can really focus on, you know, improving the basic shots. And you know, it's difficult for beginners to play together. But after you get past that stage, I think, you know, there's a real case of, you know, the group session is going to be so much more competitive. And um, that's what you need in developing players, I think. Mm. I think you do, like, you do see that in China, don't you? Kind of like they're not they're not all just having one-to-one sessions with coaches in, in random buildings. They're very much in clubs and teams and schools where they're all competing together. Yeah, yeah, it's always a big always a big group when you're watching like the China team train or or even in like you were talking with um Dan before I listened to your previous podcast and you were saying that you know there's small groups but the coaches have maybe three or four players yeah and I think I think that that's a good way to go I think um a massive group you know, obviously the coaches kind of attention is too spread out but if you have a small group you can still get that you know, you can still get that feedback, but you have the benefits of the group session, like the competitiveness and the, you know, looking at each other, learning from each other and less reliance on the coach as well. OK, that's interesting. So, so it's almost like a, a middle ground between the two, isn't it, where you've still you're still surrounded by other players, but you're you're getting kind of more of the quality coach input. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. That's my view on it anyway, I think. A small group is better than a one-to-one, in my opinion, for you know, for a certain standard player. Sure. So let's say, um, I mean, you started off as a player and then you went into coaching later. Yeah. Let's say someone is listening to this now who he's a player and they've been playing for a few years and they've kind of thought about getting into coaching before, but but just haven't haven't made the jump. Yeah. How would you suggest that they that they kind of go about doing that, getting into coaching, starting out? Um, well, I think you just need to 
go and find somewhere that you are able to get involved maybe find maybe find someone who's already coaching see if you can assist them maybe ask them if they can be a sort of a mentor to you um i think obviously you're gonna have to get cert- certified at one point for ukcc you know and that's a good good way to go so you'll learn a little bit about coaching there but i think you know for me i haven't learned the most about coaching on these ukcc courses i've learned the most you know through informal sources and you know, i follow you know a stupid amount of coaches on on twitter and things like that and i'm always reading football coaching articles and rugby coaching articles golf coaching articles um you know you can learn from other coaches in other sports really easily and i think you know because these are bigger sports they maybe have a bit more research pumped into them but you can easily apply it to to table tennis so that that's where i'm getting most of my learning from at the moment okay yeah who, who are some of the the kind of people that you've been following or, or mentors that you've had along the way you kind of either table tennis or, or non-table tennis um well do you, do you mean on like twitter or do you just mean like um you know in my coaching life <laughs> i mean both okay well um you know the coaches of bristol when when i was there was kevin satchel and Choi zito and um I learned a lot about them and their coaching through being in their practices. So, um, you know, I learned through them how to coach a little bit. Now I'm working at Cardiff City Table Tennis Club. I'm working with a group of coaches, um, Nathan Thomas, Patrick Thomas, Dan O'Connell. And, uh, you know, we're all learning from each other, really, kind of reflecting together, trying to improve. Some of the good people to follow on, on Twitter, I suppose, like, there's um Dr. Martin Toms. I think he works at the University of Birmingham and he's um you know, he's a an expert in in kind of youth coaching and kind of like that sort of thing. Um okay. there's a really good football coach called um Nick Levitt as well. He writes a blog and it's really interesting to see kind of the problems they have in football coaching and then trying to see if there's any similarities between between table tennis and football, which you wouldn't think there's a lot, but I think there's definitely similar similarities in the way that, you know, people learn how to play football and people learn how to play table tennis. Yep. Um, yeah, and there's also um, a great a great website called Propel Perform, and um, that's more based at kind of like um, strength and conditioning and things like that, but... Um, you know, they always talking about working with athletes and how you can motivate them and, you know, the, their development. And I find that really interesting as well. So, you know, there's lots of different sources of learning out there and it's not just UKCC courses that are doing it. And I think coaches need to look at this stuff more instead of just relying on kind of the UKCC framework. Yeah. OK, I'll go through all of those and try and find the links and, and put them in a blog post or something for people. But and then I guess what you're trying to do is then you kind of go around finding out all this stuff and you can kind of condense it and apply it to table tennis on, on your website. Yeah, exactly. That's what that's what I'm trying to do. I'm, you know, taking everything I'm learning from university, from um, these different blogs I'm reading. Yeah, just trying to apply it to table tennis and put it into kind of like a practical way so that other coaches can read it and get some benefit from it nice well it sounds good so if you're listening and you're a table tennis coach you should definitely head over to icoachtabletennis.com have a read of some of their articles and just i guess it will help you get into the habit of going out there looking at other things and seeing how you can apply it to your practice and that's kind of the the whole plan of the site isn't it yeah definitely that's it is there a way that people can follow you, Lloyd, on on social media? Have you got Twitter accounts and things? Uh, yeah, Twitter account is um, at L Greggs, double G, and um, you know, twi- um, I coach is on there as well. It's at I coach table tennis. Yeah, and obviously follow the Facebook for I coach table tennis as well, and then you get updates on all the latest articles. And that's a Facebook group, is it? Um, well, there's a Facebook group and a Facebook page. Um, both I coach table tennis. Um, you'll be able to find everything from from the site anyway. 
And if a coach wants to join the Facebook group, is that open or do they need an invitation or something? No, they don't need an invitation. You can find the group. Um, just um, request to join the group and uh, we'll let you in and um, start discussing coaching. So if you're the kind of coach that's interested in improving your coaching, communicating with other coaches, getting new ideas, I Coach Table Tennis is definitely something you should be checking out. Um, Lloyd, I think it's great what you're doing with Dan, kind of trying to promote and, and increase the level of coaching, I guess not just in the UK, but worldwide. So definitely keep that up. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me on as well, Ben. Yeah, it's been good talking to you. And um, yeah, good luck with everything that you're doing. I hope your players are going to be training hard over the summer. No, I'm sure they will. <laughs> Cheers, Lloyd. I'll see you later. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye. A huge thank you to Lloyd for coming on the show and talking to us. I found that really interesting, especially the stuff about group coaching, one-to-one -one coaching. As I said, that's something that I'd really experienced with Sam on the Expert in a Year Challenge. So if you're a coach, make sure you're offering your players both. If you're a player, try and look for ways to get into a nice group of players. Also have a bit of one-to-one -one coaching, maybe just once or twice a week. Or try and find one of these things where you can have one coach with kind of three or four players and you can get the input of the coach but you can also have that that kind of competitive element between your peers. I think that's really important. Strangely enough the ETTA or Table Tennis England sorry emailed me literally an hour ago saying are you ready for the magazine which gives coaches the winning edge and it looks like they're bringing out their own kind of coaching magazine written by coaches for coaches doing a similar thing to what iCoach Table Tennis are doing. So I'm looking forward to reading that, hopefully seeing some of the ideas that are in there. They've also got a new level three course coming out, which I know Lloyd wants to do. So that's good news for him. And yeah, huge thank you for listening to the show. If you're an iTunes listener, please subscribe, leave us a review, tell your friends about the show. And if you want to find out more about table tennis, head to experttabletennis.com where you can check out all my blog posts, other stuff I've got on the site, videos, and all of that. So I will see you in the next episode. This has been the Expert Tables in this podcast with me, Ben Larkham. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for listening.